Hi, I'm Mark Bryson from Shoreham, Vermont, and this is our dairy farm. I got a thousand cow dairy here, and that's your main thing. I get it. Yeah, that's the main business. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's it this is as philanthropic maybe for you or charitable in the sense of like there's other other farms that will benefit from a, a coordinated program that you know takes a a little more scientific approach and a more of a business management approach to how they breed their animals, right? So I think if there's a market for calves, per se, that have, you know, clear added value because of the sires they're using. If the genetics is known, then they're getting really good, all this, this stuff that's going on with the mathematics of it. If the genetics is known on the Holstein side, then they can do a very good job with choosing sires. You're completely correct. If there's no knowledge of, of one half of it or something like that, there's nothing that can be done. Kind of thing. Yeah. But they've been progressing quite a bit, it seems, with the sire selections for beef on dairy, with, with the conventional breeds, with the commodity breeds, um, to the point where there's even a little bit of a preference maybe for some of these animals on Holstein because Holstein, the Holstein will marvel. They will marvel. That's right. But they got small rib eyes. Yeah. And they tend to have a lot of bone. And the commercial guys hate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's a ton of open animals that are eligible for a program like that. And to some degree, if you can, I think Wyusa. Um, Pennsylvania, the cargo plant down there, the way Mario was explaining it, they have a box program for dairy. And so even if you're doing beef on dairy, it'll go into that program. And they figured out a way to box them and as a pack house, you know, create a market for their box program. Uh, but I don't know any details. I didn't probe a whole lot. Remember, that's commodity beef. It is. And it's not going to fly here. You cannot produce beef in this end of the country and compete with the guys out west. On price. On price. Yes. Or cost. You, you have something to say? or No, no, no. <laughs> you are not going to compete with the guys out west in the feedlots out west. So. It's a special. It's a specialty product. No, it costs too much here. The grain is grown in the west, mm -hmm. and the beef animals, the cow calf producers are in the west, in the west, and those guys are so efficient. And the cow calf producers out there, I mean, mm -hmm. they're not getting rich. Mm -hmm. well, let's do this. Let's kind of wade through this. Yep. We can angle things in such a way that we'll get to some of these points. These are fine points. Um, perhaps the only opportunity is calves for commodity beef. Day olds, wheat golds, batches of them going out back out west to be grown. That's very could be likely. Um, so maybe let's just take a minute. Could you tell us a little about your current operation? Um, how many head you milk here at Dayona Farm? Animals we have milk. about 1,100 milking cows. Okay. And we got another 800 beef animals and replacement animals on top of that. Okay. Anywhere from calves to two years old. Okay. And how many animals are you breeding to beef on an annual basis? Any beef breed? Oh, 250 maybe. 250, okay. And is that increasing, decreasing, or is that pretty steady on an annual basis? Pretty steady. Pretty steady. You've been doing that for how long? How many years? No. Oh. Three or four years at least. Okay. Okay. And so beef on dairy is relatively new. Three, four years time. Um, what, how have you changed your breeding plan over the past three or four years? Well, when I first started, I was using Angus. Okay. And I couldn't find a decent market for the Angus calves. It was before anybody got into this. So. I scrapped that plan and then I started looking at Wagyu and the good thing about the Wagyu is they're cavities and we are at a point where we don't need all our replacement animals and so the cavities from the Wagyu worked well on the first calf heifers. They have the calves easy and 
And then once I had the calves, I was just looking for something to do with them. And I talked to a few people in Texas and they were raising Wagyu Holstein crosses and getting some good results. So that's why I started. And you're taking all those animals out to finish then? No, no. I've only, um, I've about 40 to 50 a year. Okay. So another couple hundred or so are being sold as? They either go spread around the country as calves for people to raise or else some of them go directly to the auction. Okay. Addison, yeah. primarily? Some, yeah. Cambridge? Cambridge, some, yeah. Okay. Are you seeing better prices at one versus the other? No. Beef on dairy? No. Do you cultivate a market with the buyers at those sale barns or? We've tried unsuccessfully. Okay. okay. Um, the biggest criteria for them guys buying calves is it has to be black and it can't have any horns. Okay. And why you have horns. Mine do anyway. Yep. So they want pole genetics. You want calving ease. Is there a way to accomplish that with beef on dairy from your perspective? Or the, were the Angus tough to calve out with the blocky heads? Or? Angus are a little bit tougher, yes. Okay. But I was looking for, you know, I was looking for the Wagyu meat. Mm-hmm. And that was something I wanted to, to experiment with. So that's why I went. And the Cavanese is better. Mm -hmm. And from an economic standpoint, as a dairyman, that Cavanese is it's a big huge. piece of criteria. To me, to me, it's absolutely huge. Not all dairymen think like that. Some of them, the, the AI companies have gotten a lot of people convinced that they should be breeding their mature cows to beef and breeding all their heifers to the top bulls and then genomically testing them. But I do not go along with that. Okay. So the 250 you're breeding to beef on an annual basis out of your 1,100 milking cows, how are you choosing which ones to put? All the heifers. All the heifers? All the virgin heifers. Okay. Okay. And then all your Mature cows? All my mature cows are getting bred mostly to Holstein. Okay. Almost all. Okay. Is there a... And I get my replacements from that pool. Okay. So you got a big selection on replacements. Yes. There's even more replacements there than I need. And what do you, what do, you do with those replacements you don't need? Do you raise them to no. freshen, he, freshen heifers? Is they go to the auction immediately. There's no okay. money in raising heifers. Okay. What do you get for those calves? Holstein calves? If they're big enough, so they might want to go back on feed, they might pay a dollar a pound for them. Um, a lot of them go straight for kill. Veal markets or? Um, not, not back on feed. Okay. You know, just straight kill calves. I don't know what they do with them, hot dogs or something. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. There's, there's really not a market for dairy heifer calves. Yeah. So you're taking advantage of all the sex semen technology, you're using sex semen for? No. no. Okay. So even for your replacements, you're no. using them straight around semen. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I used sex semen when it first came out. Yep. The first bulls they sexed, I don't think they sexed their best bulls, and it kind of left me with a bad taste in my mouth. I didn't like the animals. And hmm. I don't need a sex semen. The sex semen costs a lot more. Uh, the consumption rate is less. Mm -hmm. And what about the beef? Are you sexing that semen? No. Just straight red? Okay. Okay. Uh, what is your current landing base for cropping and for pasturing? Well, we we have about 1,800 acres here that we rent or own. Okay. And as far as pasturing, we don't do a lot of pasturing. We have some that we more or less consider them exercise lots. Mm -hmm. but. They do get some feed off from them, but we do not depend on them for, for feed. Okay. And 1,800 acres provides you with what percentage of the feed requirements for your, for your dairy and your, your derivative beef operation? Is, do you buy a lot of extra feed in addition? or We buy corn silage standing. Okay. So we probably raise two-thirds of the feed okay. that we feed, yep. two-thirds of the forage. Okay. And of course, we buy commodities. We buy um, steam flake corn and canola and cornmeal and for your meal ration. Yes. Okay. Um, so no land-based space for um, ro 
rolling out a big operation. If you wanted to, uh, say, finish more beef, say you want to finish two or three times the amount of beef that you do now, uh, is there land available for you in close proximity or? Land becomes available sporadically. Okay. At a cost. <laughs> At a cost. <laughs> yeah. More every day. Yeah. A lot of competition in this area. Probably. Well, the people want out of the cities. Yeah. Yeah. Real estate is hot. Real estate is is going up fast. Yeah. In our area too, actually. Well, everywhere. We're seeing yeah. it everywhere. Yeah. If they houses, can work from home, they're houses trying. go on the market. They put a house on the market, and there's ten people bidding up the price that they ask. We have exactly that same sort of issue. Yeah. Yes. We run out of real estate. That's, I think the market the market doesn't. And work. and. You know, it's it's only a matter of time before they start seeing these, you know, these small farms as gentlemen's farms, and they'll run the price up on those and make it prohibitive. It's it's pretty much there now. So you feel like you're at capacity, and there's not a whole lot of affordable land available. Well, it depends on how far you want to travel. Yeah. You know, we're spread over three towns here. Okay. That's probably enough for you, or, or it's it's enough. Yeah. Okay. And what do you currently feed your calves up to weaning age? The ones you are taking up to weaning, what do you feed them? Um, we our milking operation. We have a a group of cows that have current mastitis, we don't treat a lot of cows, and so we will put them in a separate group, mm -hmm. and we milk them, and we run the milk into a pasteurizer, and mm -hmm. that's fed to our calves, the beef, both the beef calves and the replacement calves, okay. and they also get a, a custom mix um, grain formulation, free okay. choice. Okay. And then post weaning? Um, post weaning, they get second cut hay. Mm -hmm and another grain formulated for a growing ration mm -hmm. and uh, and we start introducing them to a TMIR at that point too. Okay. And what ages typically or weights are you weaning? Uh, well the Holsteins are a little under 200 pounds probably or right around 200 pounds mm -hmm. and the Wagyu calves are a little bit smaller so they're like 180 maybe when they're weaned two months. Okay, we need two months. Who currently manages the breeding operation and the raising of the beef? I guess I do. Okay, so you're making all the breeding selections? Yep. Administering the AI? Well, well, well. I tell somebody to do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Way to do it. I can AI, but I don't do it anymore. You're syncing up animals? And no, work. we don't. Well, we don't sync any heifers. Okay. They sink some of the cows. Okay. Okay. The heifers are chalked and bred artificially with semen on a bull I own mm -hmm. that I had drawn. Mm -hmm. And and then they go to another farm and that same bull is actually there, but there's two other bulls there too. To catch any that were missed. Okay. If you were to expand your beef operation, would that possibly create space for another full-time, would it create labor? Or would it create space for management for, say, a family member or anybody succeeding? Oh, it could, for sure. Okay. You know, as long as as long as the money is in the end product, that's, that's yeah. the key. Yeah. So markets, so markets <clears throat> for beef is, is a big question mark. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And, and you have to have a beef animal to market before you can build a market. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? So you have to assume a, a fair measure of risk. Yeah. Scaling up. Yes. To do full pots of animals or close to before you can develop a good beef market, a solid contractual beef market. Well, the guys who, who deal in beef like tractor trailer loads, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And where do they typically go if there's well, there's, I've had um, inquiries from feedlots in Iowa mm -hmm. that, you know, if I could provide tractor trailer loads, they would be interested. 
So these are yearling seven um, weights, no. six and seven weights? Or? No, they would take them weaned. They want them weaned though. Yeah, they, yeah. Nobody wants to feed a calf milk. <laughs> Absolutely nobody. <laughs> so even two and three hundred pounds. Yeah. Weaning weights. Yeah, I would say two, three hundred pounds. Pot them up and send them to Iowa. They would take them, yeah. Okay. And are those prices reasonable to cover your costs? No. Um, Plus or that I haven't haven't looked into that much. Yeah. Because I I didn't have that scale. Yeah. Yeah. If you were, would you be interested if you had a reasonable calf contract to scale at a comfortable level for your operation in coordination with other dairymen providing calves for that same contract? In other words, if you had a, a hauler come by and pick up a partial load and put together two and three other stops to make a full load for Iowa, would that be of interest or? Yeah, I guess it would. It, it, again, it's yeah, it's the end money. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what's economically feasible. And at five to six dollars, I think we talked about this. Five to six dollars a day, your cost for raising calves is that is that accurate? Between five and six dollars a day. For calves on milk, I believe it is. Yeah. I mean, I would like to see, you know, what some other people think, but, yeah. you know, some people, not everybody does the same job, too, and not everybody has the same standards. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think we do a pretty good job here, and, and we don't spare the expense. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to grow, is there affordable skilled labor? Labor is very tight. Okay. Very tight. Okay. So that's another risk that you would have to assume to expand a beef market. Yes. Okay. Seven days a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every day. Mm -hmm. Snow storms, ice storms. <laughs> what about summertime? <laughs> that's just April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to us a little about infrastructure requirements to grow your beef side of the operation. I mean, we're talking about calf hutches, calf barns, what do we... I think I've got some pretty simple calf barns here and calf hutches. Calves do great in hutches. Okay. And, you know, I I think it's a reasonable way to go. Yep. You don't have to build a big barn. I think some, you know, some some calf hutches and some three sided sheds that face the south. Mm -hmm. As long as you do a good job feeding them and keeping them clean and dry, they do really well. We put blankets on them in the winter for the newborns. Okay. So they have extra mm -hmm. warmth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They need those calories to stay warm and grow. Mm -hmm. Are you at capacity right now with calves? Yes. Okay. Do you know what it would cost you per head to add calf capacity? No. No. The hutches themselves, if you went that route, was oh, a pretty simple. Hutches are three, four hundred dollars a piece. Yeah. Would you say that between labor and infrastructure, that's what you would lack operationally? before you could expand? I mean, if you had yeah. a guaranteed market. Yeah, yeah, because right now, my facilities for the dip, for the beef I'm doing yep. and the dairy I need, yep. my facilities are full. Yeah, you're at capacity. So you'd have to expand. You have right. room, but need some infrastructure, need some labor, yeah. if there were a guaranteed yep. calf buyback program. Okay. Are you interested in, um, so let's talk about sourcing a little bit on your on your sire selections. Um, you, you currently raise your own bull, you've collected from your own bull. Are you looking to um, keep exploring options for sire selections for your beef on dairy? Um, well, you try to learn from what you've done and, yeah. and I think my bull that 
that I drew had a lot of growth on the Wagyu side mm -hmm. and adding that to a Holstein maybe we we get some animals that are that are too tall mm -hmm. and and uh, you know not not the absolute beef type animals we get some outliers mm -hmm. and I think with a you know with with a better choice of bulls I think you can eliminate that or cut back on that but you also cut back on the animal's size so you lose size so you, you would moderate your you growth powers yeah I, and, growth. And I think it would be a good idea to to look for something a little bit more moderate in growth okay just eliminate those outliers that are right large frame okay do you feel like you have a source for those genetics yeah, start? I think there's, you know, yes, there's a source for genetics in this country. It, it's, it gets a little pricier than, than what I'm doing. What's your top limit on semen straws that you would well, stand under? I shoe my own bull and I raised my own bull. So, yeah. but if you want to buy semen, I think you pretty, you want to buy quality Wagyu semen, with some numbers behind it, it's gonna cost you at least $25 a unit. Okay, and if you went to a conventional beef breeds, like Simplex programs, you mentioned uh, Red Focus, or what are they, are they in the same range? I got no idea what those guys get for some. Okay. Probably a little less if I had to guess. But not much less, I think you're right. You're getting up there with good data behind these, these semen selections. So, right. Okay. What kind of characteristics, you mentioned, you know, moderating the growth of the Holstein, what kind of characteristics would raise your confidence in beef on dairy genetics? In other words, um, with Wagyu, you got the, you've certainly got the marbling, you've got a high-end beef product. Um, you've got growth characteristics of certain lines of Wagyu sires, for sure. Um, is it the ribeye piece? Is that something that you would like to add to your beef on dairy genetics? Or well, I think that's something you have to pay attention to. Okay. Because the blowback from feedlots might be, I can't get these ribeyes to comply with the carcass right. characteristics that they right. want at the pack house. Right. I got to eliminate this contract. For instance, it, it, it would be a, a pushback from a, a feedlot or a finisher. Well, usually they just dock you on the price and they convince you that you need to change that way. Economically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's, let's bridge into economics a little bit. Would you consider your beef on dairy operation, that portion of your operation, profitable and sustainable at this point? I'm hoping so. Okay. <laughs> I don't really know at this point. Okay. You know, it's it's hard to separate the beef and the dairy operation at this point because the equipment for the dairy is yeah. all used for the beef too. Tell, yeah. Tell so, us about how they're integrated. So, yeah. Talk to us a little more. Well, about that. the dairy cows have more or less built the farm and paid for the farm and bought the machinery, and we could keep growing the dairy and add more cows and build more barns and stuff but we've kind of come to a place here that this area this barn fits this area and it's not mm -hmm. add on mm -hmm. so what i did is i tried to take some extra capacity that i had mm -hmm. i didn't need all my replacement animals mm -hmm. i had animals i had to get to calf to make milk mm -hmm. and I needed the calf to come out easy mm -hmm. and so that is where the Wagyu came in and since we have feed available on the farm and we had extra capacity they fit into that niche. Mm -hmm. Even the refusals? Yes, are and actually the, the animals that are finished are finished on refusals from the milking dairy, milking herd because we want to make sure that the milking herd has fresh 100% feed, 
not picked over feed in front of them to keep the dry matter intake up, to keep the milk production up. Mm -hmm. So we purposely overfeed them and then we clean up that feed and rather than throw it away, it goes into the finished animals. So in a sense, beef is being fed a byproduct of the dairy operation. Yes, the beef uh, are coming as a byproduct. And it frees you to feed your dairy the way you want yes. to a little more yes. because you know that you're getting some revenue offset for those costs that you're assuming with really high standards on your feed program. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. What are the central challenges you face in your current cost structure? Um, is it the cost of that infrastructure and labor for the operation? Is it uh, not being able to track and tease out the beef side from the dairy side and what's actually going in to the beef to understand whether or not a price that somebody's willing to pay you is really that, like definitively profiting you? Right, well, okay. the price on the end animal has to you know, has to justify the extra labor and stuff and, and the capacity. I mean, mm -hmm. if you didn't have those animals, things would be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. It's it's more work having the extra animals. So you want to make, you, you'd like to make some money on them. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at Chicago mercantile pricing at $1.40 to $1.60, sometimes as low as $1.35 per pound for finished beef, no. There's no way you can compete with that. No, I'm, I'm not going to compete with those guys. They're too good at what they do. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to see, it's going to be, have to be north of current market prices. Yes, it has yeah. to be, it has to be north of commodity beef prices. Mm -hmm. Which becomes a specialty product, which yes. you're poised to take advantage of. Yes. If and when the market opportunity comes. Yes. So markets a little bit, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned scale being a prohibitive factor right now to access certain markets, calf markets for instance. That Iowa farm that was willing to buy your day and week olds by the pot is accessible if you have scale, but other than that, if you don't have scale, you can't access that market. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the trucking is prohibitive to Iowa. and. Those guys want lots of animals, like animals. They want lots of like animals mm -hmm. because that's how their business is geared and that's how they understand things and that's how they do things. Mm -hmm. They have everything measured right down to the fraction. Mm -hmm. Is there any comp so competition's not really a concern or is it the Western competition that Um, I don't want to raise commodity beef. Okay. And I'm not gonna. Yeah. Because I can't do it. Yeah. Would you like to throw more beef on dairy calves from your current dairy operation and create new markets that way? Or? I could, you know, if the market is there. Yeah. I mean, beef on dairy is new. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think they've probably gotten any animals into the slaughterhouses yet. With these fancy genetics, yeah. Well, yeah. no, I don't think they've gotten them into the slaughterhouses with any genetics at this point yet. Yeah, winding the clock back to 2017, 2018. Right, and yeah. so this is new, I think, the Wagyu Holstein could have a tremendous impact in this country because dairy has excess um, gestations available. They do not need all of them. Right. And it creates a high-end product. Mm -hmm. And the guys out west have figured out how to feed them. Mm -hmm. and not, not the genealogy too or anything like that, but the feeding is the, is the one that's most important. Well, feeding is very important, yeah. very important. I mean, genetics are important, but the feeding is, is ultra important. Now, I told you about these animals that get too tall and too big. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to the guy in Iowa that owns a feedlot, and he says they put them on feed, finished feed, a lot earlier. 
and that's how they control that. So they finish them younger. Mm -hmm. And the problem is with younger animals throughout other breeds, or all cattle, is they do not marvel until they get a certain amount of age on them. Mm -hmm. And this is where the Wagyu comes in. The Wagyu will marvel at an earlier age mm -hmm. if they're fed right. Mm -hmm. And these guys know how to control the protein intake and the energy intake to keep them from building frame and to add muscle. So they want them early. They want them early. Yeah, they, they, they do not want animals that have been running around the pasture for 15 months. Mm -hmm. They do not want them. Mm -hmm. But even after you've had those conversations, the pricing they're willing to put together for you is not attractive. It's not hugely attractive. No, they. Yeah. When I was talking to them, they were talking like you know twenty twenty five cents a pound over. Okay. Commercial beef. Okay. If you could get them to pay a premium for the water, sometimes they will, sometimes they will not. But didn't the Holstein influence scare them? No, the Holstein influence does not scare them. They know what they were. Okay. I thought there was. But they want you to cover trucking. Or um, share the cost I don't or? really know about that. Uh, yeah. I never got that far into it. Okay. But I know it had to be a truckload to make it feasible. Yeah. yeah. How many calves fit on a truck? Wow. Ninety thousand pounds. They want ninety thousand pound load. Okay. Okay. I think that's the number. Seems high. Gross weight, right? Yeah. That's everything. So. Yeah. That's a lot of calves. It's, it's like, like 80, 90 yeah. calves. Yeah. Somewhere in that range. They double that on many legs. Some of them are triple. Okay. Okay, well, this is really helpful. Is there anything else you want to add that you feel like is relevant as far as a consideration when, as a dairyman primarily, you think about beef and beef on dairy and working that diversified revenue stream into your, your business? Anything else you want to um, throw out as far as considerations? I think that you're going to have a hard time convincing dairymen to raise calves. From day to week old to weaning. Yes. That's the gap. Yes. Yeah. I think if this is going to work, you know, and we don't have these here, but if you go to Texas and you go to Arizona, they have calf ranches. And they specialize in that. Yeah. And those guys could do this. But I think that's what you need. And you need to have these animals coming in from a lot of sources. Mm -hmm. And of course they have to get colostrum, they have to be taken care of right. Mm -hmm. And then you get them on a calf ranch and then you can go from there. You can either have the feedlot here mm -hmm. or you could have the feedlot where the grain is. Or both. Or both. Some combination to really take on this influx of, of right. beef dairy cash that could come from if you want to keep them in the east, we have a huge amount of people, Boston, New York mm -hmm. City, and more people all the time, mm -hmm. and I think that's where the Wagyu and Holstein works. It's, it's a super high quality product if it's done right, and it can bring a premium. Mm -hmm. And I think it could bring enough of a premium to make it profitable mm -hmm. if the right people get in it and they do it right. Mm -hmm. On the feed side, ensuring good sire selection. Yeah, this is keeping any, good data. Genetics, yep. All those things, yep. And you gotta have slaughterhouses. Well, that's another problem is is slaughter capacity. Wyusa is five hours away. I know that they require two hundred per batch of finished animals. That's they do two hundred per hour. I guess that's what they need. Uh, that's cargo. Wyusa. There's a smaller Nichols. 
or Nick, Nicholas? Nicholas. Nicholas. They do 50 batches. So a single pot could go to them. They do about 40 to 50 an hour. So they don't want anything less than a single hour's worth. Um, but that's the range. Of the, both those are five, six hour drives from Vermont. Which, is that reasonable from your perspective? Five to six hour trip or? You know, much choice at this point. At this point. Yeah, nobody else has the capacity. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Japanese are very fastidious about that, about how the animals are transported and what time they're transported. They transport early in the morning and they don't overcrowd. And you know, that's that's part of their thing, and that's that's what is built into the wagyu, but. Hmm. They're very particular on that, and and they would say five hours is too much. Okay. Absolutely, if you went and talked to the Japanese producers that are raising full blood wagyu, and they're trying to get into the A5 market, which is the best, it's way too long. Is that because of stress level? Or stress, just... yes. Stress on the animals. Hmm. And you want to honor their. <laughs> Their product, their treasure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't, I don't think this country needs to produce A5 wagyu. I don't think the American public needs it or wants it. Yeah. I think we need to, I think we need to put some more marbling into the beef we have and have it be a better eating experience. And I think that would be good enough. Have you heard anything about the Western pack houses starting to demand some Wagyu influence? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. What have you What have you heard about that? Wow. Well, Snake River Farms has got twelve hundred bulls that they lease out to cow calf producers, and then they buy the calves back. That's agri beef, right? Agri beef. And I have a guy that I sold bulls to last year down in Texas. He actually came to Vermont and he bought bulls because. Not agri beef, but there was some other people that were putting bulls out and contracting calves. They were cutting into his market, so he needed more bulls to lease out to bring animals back in. So I the think demand for wagyu bulls. Is, yes. Okay. I think the demand for wagyu bulls is is growing. I heard last week that the percent of finished beef animals in the U.S. that finished prime went up as high as 10% last year. Yeah, and it'd been running like 3% forever. Yeah. yeah, now it's up to like 10% and largely due to either feed or genetics or some combination of the two. Genetics, some. Um, yeah. Um, some of it is on feed longer. The okay. feedlots got backed up. They held their animals COVID. longer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Slaughterhouses shut down. Yeah, that's right. That's, oh. That is part of it. That's probably the biggest net effect, isn't it? More than likely. The restaurants yeah. weren't taking, there was no need. You know? gotcha. But there is, you know, there is, why you influence genetics out there and it's yep. more popular than you they will hit that prime mm -hmm. how long let's talk about the finish side a little bit how what's the average age that you're finishing your animals oh uh, i if you really want a prime animal i don't think i could and this is the way i feed and it might not be right because I do what is complementary to the dairy right. and what my facilities dictate. Mm -hmm. So I do not put my animals on a finished feed until, you know, they're maybe 18, 20 months old. Okay. And I think realistically they should probably be going on feed before that. And, and then they could be killed at 20, 24, 20 to 24. I think 20 is too young. But 24, I think, you could harvest Holstein Wagyu crosses and hit prime if they're fed right and they're fed long enough. Mm -hmm. That's a key. But right now, my best animals or my animals that I really think fit what I want to do are 30 months old. Okay. So sometimes they do not go on finished feed until they're 24 months old. And before that, are they on like a heifer ration? Yeah, they're on a, like a grower ration. Okay. You know, I, I don't I don't want all these animals ready at the same time because I want to spread my animals out over the year. Mm -hmm. So, 
the guys out west would absolutely cringe at that because it runs up your costs. But mm -hmm. I don't have the capacity to kill them all at once and store them, mm -hmm. or or have that many coming, you know, all along. Can you talk a little about your market channels for your finished beef right now? Your um, I have a wholesale license. Mm -hmm. I have a retail license. Um, we sell halves. We sell quarters. Mm -hmm. We sell whole animals. Mm -hmm. um, I sell some animals live mm -hmm. to other people who are maybe filling in holes in their mm -hmm. in their business that they need an animal, you know, to fill up, fill an order. Mm -hmm. Or they're or they're growing their herd to the part of, of marketing. Right. They just haven't gotten there yet. But you have to build a market before you can <laughs> slaughter animals. So it's a long on ramp. Yes. For somebody starting out. Yeah. So. Okay. And you're pushing fifty to sixty animals on an annual basis, finished beef through those current market channels. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple farm stands. Yeah. So and buy the package. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit direct to consumer. And yeah. Yes. And there's interest of more and more. We got more people that are mm -hmm. interested in our product at their location. So my daughter has a job in New Hampshire. She works in a hospital and medical lab, and so she comes up, loads up on meat, she takes it back, and people at the hospital are buying meat. So that and actually that's that's growing pretty good too. Yeah. You know, just yeah. packages this, you know, specialty cuts. Well, we do variety boxes, which yep. are about thirty pounds and. And then some people just want ribeye steaks, and some people just different cuts. I mean, but mm -hmm. but she, she hasn't doesn't come home a whole lot. But when she does, she's like, oh, I got a list this long, and so she'll take she'll take you know a pretty good chunk of chain, a chunk of meat, and then she'll Venmo me the money back. So it works. But people are like, just when you're going home again, those are so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We just had a local restaurant up here. There's a local restaurant in town. They're closed. They closed because of COVID, but they're hoping to open up again. So he bought how many pounds of brisket the other day? Oh, Fifty something pounds of brisket. Fifty pounds of brisket. Mm -hmm. He wants to make some uh, corned beef, and he wants dinners to go. They're doing takeout orders. Takeout orders. Oh. St. Patty's Day. Until yeah. 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 yeah, and then April they're hoping to open again. But um, mm -hmm. he's trying to to do some smoke. Um, mm -hmm. brisket this summer and ribs and stuff mm -hmm. out the door if, if the restaurant allows it but the capacity is kind of small for um, mm -hmm. indoor dining mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. and we have some restaurants that are interested in um, in buying halves mm -hmm. and and the chefs want to cut it themselves mm -hmm. and so um, there's some new markets that are up and coming but yeah. once I think the Wagyu name the people will start associating it with a quality product and in a price a range. Product. Gotta be a good product though. And it's gotta be in a price range that they can, they can they afford. Can go. I mean, I mean they gotta be able to make money on it and I gotta be able to make money on it. Mm -hmm. But you can't find it in the grocery store. So that's the yeah. novelty of it. It's yet to be commoditized. Yeah. But at fifty percent parentage, that can be sold as Wagyu, right? Yes. Yeah. American Wagyu. American Wagyu. American Wagyu. Yep. No, they were supposed to be. Oh. Not everything works out 100%. <laughs> well, the reason these guys are down here is they can't go in a headlock. Okay. So instead of getting leftover dairy feed, they get fresh dairy feed. <laughs> oh, 43, 40, 49. Oh, that's too far. 49 might be under 30 months. 49? 49 and 53. Well, we want to be, then I guess they're going to quarter it, they're going to cut it in their, yeah. in their restaurant. That's what this guy's going to do, he's going to quarter it. Yeah, they were supposed to be dehorned. Are these Mirage? Oh, that's Eli. Okay. That's one of Shields. He probably could stay in here for a month. Okay. These are ready for weaning? These are weans. These are weans. Weans, oh, yes. Yeah. These are actually a little bit older. Some of these, these might be three months old. Okay. So they're getting colostrum. They're getting lichen. Yeah. 
These are a bunch of Wagyu cows that I have orders for. And these two were put the rest of them put blankets on them. The rest of them, it wasn't that cold out. What a crazy. So they get double moved. The extra calf yeah, I, you know, I'll try to keep the heat in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. They're friendly work. because they think they're getting milk, but <laughs> they aren't getting that. Yeah. You guys got to keep it. But you want it face and south. Yeah. Southwest. Yeah. I mean, the sun comes in here and. They just love it, and the air is great. Yeah. The sun is everything. 